the Bookstack project has now hit 10,000 stars on GitHub. Now, GitHub stars are a bit of a dodgy metric, to be honest. They can vary massively depending on the type of project you have and even the regional audience that you're building for. But it does allow us to kind of measure relatively to ourselves about how the project is growing over time. So here I've jumped into the GitHub repo stats that I've created for the Bookstack project. It just shows a bunch of charts for specific metrics that GitHub provides. And here we can see those stars. This chart shows the cumulative growth over time, whereas this one shows the per monthly star uh, additions. So you can see since the start of the project, or at least the public announcement of the project, we've kind of had a nice general growth over time with a bit of an acceleration. So you can see we're kind of topping up, we're getting more towards the 200s per month, whereas Previously, we were at the 100s around there. And then we have some outliers, such as this little spike here. And that's from a bunch of publicity that started on Hacker News, a post that I put on Hacker News went popular and get a lot more attention on cases like that. Since then, it's backed off a bit, but we've still got fairly good velocity in the amount of stars that we're getting. And yeah, it's helped us to kind of creep up and get to that 10,000 point. We can see at the start of the year, we're about 8,000. So in that time, we've got a nice couple of thousand gained to get us to that 10K. Now to mark this milestone, I thought we'd do something a little bit different and look back on the original post that I put up for Bookstack on Reddit. Now this was the first bit of kind of outbound marketing or just any just sharing of the project that I did. And to put this into context, I started Bookstack about mid 2015 and then there was a, a period of rapid development. I've actually got a post on the blog from way back in 2016 when I was celebrating a year of Bookstack, which shows the design changes throughout this process. As you can see it changed quite a lot in terms of style until getting up into October when it kind of looks fairly similar in a lot of ways to what Bookstack currently is. So after that period of rapid development, I then shared the project with this post, and I believe we hover over the date there. That is the 1st of Jan 2016, so New Year's Day. From what I remember, got fairly positive reception, but we'll go through and have a look at the comments and see how they compare in terms of what Bookstack is today and how things have evolved. So the first comment, some positive feedback, but then it goes on to ask, in a non-trying to get a flame more thing question, just to know a little more about the past and future of the project, what made you pick MIT over AGPL? And this is in terms of the license. So the MIT license that we chose is very permissive. You use not a lot of restrictions in terms of what you need to do when you're using the Bookstack code base. It does make it so that a company could take the code base and improve it and keep that proprietary and not reshare that even if they provided that as a service. Whereas the AGPL adds additional protections for such cases. So if we license books like under AGPL and someone took that and made changes to it and then provided that as a managed service publicly on the internet, then they'd also have to provide the code for that publicly on the internet. So you can't redistribute without also providing the sources for the code. So it adds additional protections to the code and ensures freedoms of the code and for that its users. So as I mentioned in my comment there, I pick MIT because it's very, I mean, one, it's very simple. There's not a lot of text in it, so it's quite easy to understand. Also, a lot of the libraries that I'm using are MIT based. So it's kind of keeps some alignment there with the underlying technology that I'm already using. It's simpleness and permissiveness makes it very easy to pick up a bit of software and start using it. And I've, I've always respected the kind of full freedom that such a permissive license perm permits. Like you don't need to think how you might use this even in a business context. There is obviously some risk there that someone could take that and make it proprietary and serve it, as I said earlier. But to be honest, when I was creating this, that's not really a concern for me. I, I don't mind that. I understand that that could happen. If that happens, then that's going to happen. But we can continue building the free version and keep that community project going as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, it wasn't a major concern to me to prevent those issues and the simplicity and raw, I guess, lack of conditions that the MIT prov license provides. Just, yeah, that's what appealed to me in terms of applying it to this project. I must admit, over the last seven years, I've come to 
more understand the GPL based licenses and come to respect them a lot more. I think nowadays I'd be more tempted to choose the AGPL license, for example, but it's still maybe 50 50 in my mind which one I'd go, whether it's MIT or an AGPL license. It really comes down to your particular concerns and philosophy as well in terms of what you expect for your software and the freedoms that you want to provide. Next comment, that is some of the weirdest lorem ipsum text I've ever seen. Seems an interesting project though. So I think if we go back to our website, it might be referring to that used in the screenshot here. So this would be a different screenshot than what would have been at that time, but I have a feeling the text is much the same and it is pretty weird. So I believe this is just like a dummy text generator. A lot of the time you use lorem ipsum, but I think at the time I was trying to use something that was a bit closer to English text and not specifically Laura Mipson, but it did come out with some fairly strange stuff. I think I've also used Bluth Ipsum, so text related to Arrested Development, which if you're not familiar with that TV show, that could be seen as even stranger. But I think I've used that in some demo cases, but I can't remember exactly where. Next up, this comment says, nice, I've been looking for a good confluence alternative. I'm not too happy what was out there. I was debating on starting a similar project myself because of that, but this seems promising and just what I'm looking for. I originally built Bookstack after looking for something at the company that I was at to use as an internal documentation platform. And Confluence was one of those potential platforms because it does provide an ease of use as a documentation platform and it has a WYSIWYG editor and things like that. But my main concern with going down that road was that the user cost ramps up quite significantly at specific intervals. I thought that was a massive shame that getting billing involved for quite significant jumps in some cases would be a barrier to adoption for people within the company building documentation. And I, I really didn't want that. And I, I thought it was a big shame. But I did assess other options out there like DocuWiki and MediaWiki and things like that. But I just found there was this product in the space that provides an ease of use out of box. I appreciate with a lot of the other alternatives out there, you can get them to that point with a lot of plugins and configuration, but then there's a lot of questions around how well those are supported and how well they're integrated in there. So I thought, hey, why not build my own? That could be pretty easy. All it is is just a WYSIWYG editor and a database. Should be doable in a couple of hours, really. But here we are, seven years later, still building it out. So yeah. So this comment says, uh, looks interesting. I'm currently using DocuWiki for the most part, but have been looking for a Confluence alternative. My only question is if you have any plans for LDAP slash Active Directory support. Didn't spot it in there at present. So at the time, I absolutely didn't have any LDAP or Active Directory support. But based off of the comments that I was receiving from um, Reddit directly and elsewhere, LDAP became requested quite quickly. Therefore, it got implemented relatively soon after that. Um, so if we have a look at this issue actually. It looks like this was a request for around the same time. If we have a look about when it was completed. So yeah, end of Jan 2016. Now looking back on that, I'm not so sure I would have implemented that as quick as I would have. Applying hindsight now. Just because adding those authentication systems, they add a lot of, I guess, a technical and mental debt in terms of the development process. Just because I was not familiar with LDAP at all. And getting my head around the full kind of requirements needed and the different variations that people have and the full kind of uh, expectations and what needs to be supported there was quite a lot. And then the features like this, they often have very specific business case processes that need to be met. And they all slightly differ between maybe different authentication systems that you have. They're also just targeting a, a kind of subset of the audience of Bookstack that specifically want that authentication system. And to me, they're not exactly a fun thing to work on. They're quite boring and it's quite important that you get them right as well. So there's a element of pressure there. Yeah, I must admit that there were authentication features upon that. Also, we've got SAML2 and OpenID Connect now. But they've kind of made me felt burnt out on the project a few times in the past just because I've been in the midst of working on those and then just been not happy with what I'm doing and then kind of lost a lot of um, spirit in the project, I guess. But now I'm a bit more comfortable with them after you know seven years of development. Yeah, maybe I would have held off, got a better perspective on those and spent a bit more time before implementing them. But hey, they're in there now. So this comment, another positive one, um, looks great and can't wait to try it out. Have you considered packaging it for Sandstorm? They'd love it over there. So Sandstorm 
is a platform for self-hosting. I'll be honest, I haven't got a lot of requests specifically for Sandstorm as of recent, um, but I did have a few at that time. But I still get a fair number of requests to package it for specific environments, you know, support this specific operating system, support this self-hosting platform and make it into a, a Red Hat package, make it into a Debian package. I've kind of kept my distance from doing any of these because making your software work with these is still takes some effort. You'll have to understand this platform. You'll have to watch out for their changes. You'll have to think about when you make changes in for me in Bookstack, how that might affect those platforms. You know, just doing one or two might not be too bad. But when you start to get all these different platforms added in and supported, then you're adding a lot of potential maintenance debt and effort to your development cycle. So I kind of keep a hands off approach and keep books like very kind of platform abstract. That way I just make sure it can work on anything and then leave it up for others to implement it for specific platforms. So the only platforms that I specifically actually support are Ubuntu LTS releases where we provide the official scripts just because that provides a really fixed number of targets for me to work to. And it's for a set of platforms that, are, that I'm comfortable with while also being quite generally widespread in their use. Outside of that, I don't do anything myself, but it is available through the work of others. So for example, I believe there's an Arch Linux package for Bookstack that someone maintains. And then there's also a Home Assistant. So yeah, the Home Assistant community add-on for Bookstack, which is mainly maintained by Paul Sinclair, who does an absolute excellent job of uh, packaging Bookstack for Home Assistant. So yeah, I leave it to these people that know better in terms of these external platforms. And I just focus on the platform itself, make Bookstack better. You know, time isn't infinite. We only have so much energy to focus. And I think it's most important to focus on the platform itself. Then someone here is having issues with uh, following the documentation and it looks like there was uh, an issue in the instructions originally. It happens, then we fix that up. But one thing that I noticed is that they're using Turnkey Linux, specifically Turnkey Linux LAMP. And I believe as of this year, we go to the Turnkey Linux site. So Turnkey Linux themselves uh, provide pre-packaged operating systems for apps. So you can download an ISO, then run that on your system as a VM or directly maybe. But as of this year, I believe they actually have a specific Bookstack turnkey Linux distribution. So here it is, the Bookstack turnkey Linux system. So you can just download that and start running it in its VM. They seem to package in a whole bunch of nice stuff that you can uh, choose options during the install process for Bookstack and it sets everything up and it's got some maintenance options in there. I don't use it too much myself, but I've given it a quick test run and it seems pretty cool what they're doing. But yeah, just interesting to see now, seven years on, there's something pre-configured specifically built for Bookstack in the same kind of technology stack that they're using there. So this person is also having some issues. Um, looks like they came across an error which again, it looks like there was a bug in the code. That's the thing that's gonna happen, especially initially releasing something to a wider audience. A lot of issues are gonna pop up that you kind of never even thought to test. It looks like that gets fixed, but then there's further issues. Um, that's because they're just uploading the Bookstack install folder into a public web space. Now this is quite a big expectation in a lot of PHP apps that you can just download the files, upload them into a folder, and be able to access those within that folder on your website. Bookstack doesn't really work in that way. We follow the conventions of the framework that we use, so Laravel, and require people to point their web server to the public folder within our files. And the benefit of doing this is then you're not exposing most of the application files publicly on a web server they're not accessible at all in web space, is only the files within a certain folder. So things are much more controlled in terms of what you expect people to have access to when they're accessing it through a browser. And it prevents a whole class of potential vulnerabilities that people may be able to exploit in those application files. So it is technically possible to work around that. And some people do, and there's also there's some guides out there, but I push back on that every time and I steer people away as much as possible because it doesn't work to a secure setup and to you don't know what those workarounds might miss in their implementation in terms of potential issues that can arise. This does mean it's really hard to install Bookstack in some certain environments that don't support being able to point where your web server is serving files from. But in my mind, that is a really kind of fundamental feature of what a web server should provide. And in that case, I don't want to lessen the security of Bookstack and its users due to the lesser abilities of a hosting provider.
in my mind, any worthwhile hosting provider should have those options there. So THS Online is saying, I'll use this project to organize my school data. That's a common case I've heard about a few times. Any plans for import and export for books? This would enable me to have a cloud and local version when I have no connectivity. And I say, yes, uh, import export is in various formats is definitely on my to-do list. That is kind of still on a to-do list in a very abstract way, because what is import export? What are the expectations there? And we can see instantly uh, this user listing out a whole bunch of different options, which expresses the complication in providing such a feature if that people expect things in a lot of different formats. So, I mean, now we have got a range of export formats. We've got PDF, Markdown, text and HTML, but we still get like uh, Word documents and um, other formats requested here and there. And this user here is asking for export to a whole bunch of third party services. And that's something that I'll try and avoid where possible that I don't want to be reliant on third party services for core functionality where possible. When you build to third party services like that, you have moving targets in terms of those platforms might change and you'd have to keep up with their changes as well as they often the integrations would require extra user configuration as well. So it's more hassle on the user side to set that up. And then it's more on us to document that. And then to keep that documentation update as the user interfaces change for these platforms is a bit of a struggle. Yeah, it would only do kind of uh, formats that don't require external systems and also try and work to formats that are open and freely available. In terms of import, we really don't have much, but we have since developed the API and you can automate a lot of import of content through the API, but we don't have inbuilt import within the platform itself because that's something that's actually very hard to build in terms of what formats are you supporting. There's not like a very, very standard import for documentation content. And as soon as you get into file formats that can have a lot of complexity, like PDFs and uh, Word documents, the amount of variation and kind of user expectations in terms of how their content would be imported, it varies wildly. So I've always been uh, wary to get any level in terms of importing other formats, but instead we focus on providing those abstract interfaces like the API so that people can script it themselves to manipulate their formats into what Bookstack expects. This user has experienced some issues in trying to use Bookstack. They're getting an error with their database where it can't use the full text indexes which Bookstack tries to use. So within the earlier versions of Bookstack, we'd use the MySQL full text search indexes to provide proper searching ability with decent performance of page content. But this actually presented a whole load of edge case issues in terms of how the full text indexing work. It's something that can work very well, but it has to be highly tuned to the type of content that you're searching. And people would use Bookstack in all different ways and the different languages that are used would highly influence how well their content works with those full text indexes. And it would try and do things like it would uh, discount stop words or short words. And it was causing a whole bunch of kind of strange edge case scenarios that were hard to pin down. So eventually we actually removed the use of full text indexes from books that instead we implement our own indexing system of words within content that we can do more advanced things with. Like for example, we increase the scores of titles and even headings within content get scored higher than normal content. And then lastly, we've got this comment. Uh, this looks amazing. I will definitely use this. And when I use it for corporate, expect donations. I didn't accept donations at that time and I kept money out of the project for a very long while because to be honest I didn't really need it. I don't think it'll be viable to kind of support the project fully long term. It'll be about five years later where I did start accepting donations and at that point I realized that I could use those donations to support a lot of the dependencies that we use so the other projects that we use within Bookstack itself and then since then I've seen that it might be viable to use donations and some other streams of revenue to work on Bookstack much more full time, which is currently what I'm doing at the moment. Although currently still working at a loss, but it's, it's almost viable. It's within sight now that that might actually be possible. So yeah, things have changed in that department quite significantly. So yeah, that's all the comments in that thread. I hope that's been interesting to have a look back and see how perspectives have changed over that time for the project.
If you're interested in more of the behind the scenes element and open source thinking in general, then I've recently started another channel on YouTube called Dan on Open Source or DOS, where I go into the details of my experiences and the more nuanced scenarios of working and maintaining on open source. So feel free to check out those. There's only two videos in there right now, but I've got a whole list of videos that I'm looking to produce for this channel. But yeah, that's everything for me. Thanks for checking in on this milestone of 10,000 stars and have a wonderful day.